This is the Imperfect Podcast. Don't forget to check us out at hecklercane.com and download our episodes for free on iTunes and SoundCloud. Today on the Imperfect Podcast, we're interviewing writer, producer, and distributor Sam Sherman. He was very kind to invite us to his house in New Jersey, where we picked up our mobile version of the podcast and brought it over there to him. He is a legend in the in the independent film world. He has been had his hand in horrors, westerns, sci-fis, actions, and even black exploitation films. He's given us a great insight into what's going on in the independent world and what has been going on since the 60s. Uh, he is the founder of the Independent International Pictures. And this interview is interview one of two. So on this special in- interview section of the Imperfect Podcast, uh, as we travel with the podcast, we are doing a two-part series on Sam Sherman. He's a great guy. He invited us to his house. Sal got a chance to sit, sit down with him and talk, and um, the rest of us all played camera crew. So that was fun, too. Um, please, without further ado, Sam Sherman. Well, Sam, welcome to the Imperfect Podcast. Thank you for having us to your home. This is a real special treat for us. I know um, I have to also thank Ethan Martin, who made the recommendation that we come meet with you. Um, Tell us a little bit about yourself and your background and your company, The Independent. Well, I'm a little concerned of being on an imperfect podcast. <laughs> I'm always a perfectionist. What am I going to do here? It's so different. <laughs> I believe it. Yeah. Why I is mean, it imperfect? We don't like. We like to set um, the bar very low, <laughs> mm-hmm. and we like to over. You know what is the saying? Um, uh, under, um, under promise and over deliver. <laughs> I've always said regarding the public, no matter how low we go in making a movie, the public always takes us one step lower. <laughs> <laughs> I believe it. I believe that for sure. Anyway, but, well, why, what do you want me to tell you? How I got into this business? Sure. Like, where did your love of movie making come from? Well, it started with a love of still photography. So I started being interested in still photography, then in whole movie photography, Mm -hmm. and I had been given my uncle's old regular 8mm camera and projector, and I made little regular 8mm movies, and I also collected old little regular 8 comedies and Charlie Chaplin and westerns and things like that. So that's how I I got interested. And I always liked movies uh, from the beginning when I started going to the movies at the age of four. Uh. And so I liked the movies and I liked the whole idea of them. First time I was in a theater, the thing that impressed me was how enormous the screen was. And that was before television, before uh, home movies, before anything. I just, oh my God, look at that huge thing. And that was a movie. And I love going to the theater. I love going to movies. So you were inspired by the awe of it all. Yeah. In a sense. That's right. And then television came in, and they had a lot of old films that they ran. And I, of course, had never seen them. I didn't know anything about them. Mm -hmm. But I got to like them. And that kind of took me in that direction. That got me interested in films from that there. And I I basically uh, started as a collector, Uh a collector of, of movies. And I collected regular 8 millimeter, little short cut down 5 minute films and then 15 minute films and then I got 16 millimeter projectors and they began to run an hour and an hour and a half. And I, at that time there was no home video and uh, I wanted to have certain films that I could see and also preserve because I thought a lot of them were so obscure that if I didn't have them, nobody would have them. And so I started collecting them, 16 millimeter films. And I became a collector. And through all that, I became a film historian. I started studying the history of films. And the history of films was incredible, going back to the late 1800s and Mm -hmm. then into silent movie features and then into sound and all that. And I began to study and learn and write. And I I was hired by James Warren, 
who produced Famous Monsters of Filmland and other <laughs> magazines. And I was hired by him as a uh, supplier of old movie stills, a film historian, a writer. And he had his editor, Forrest J. Ackerman, who was very popular, and he was writing a lot of stories, but couldn't keep up with everything, so they used to farm out articles to me. <laughs> and I got involved with that, and along the way, I got to interview just tons of people, tons of people, directors, producers, actors, and uh, I always was interested in the most obscure ones, but I got to meet some of the more famous people along the way, most notably John Wayne. Oh, wow. John Wayne, like me, because I knew all about his early work when he was a young man starting out and just beginning, and I'd seen most of those pictures. I collected a lot of them, and uh, he couldn't believe it. He just couldn't believe it. How do you have all these things? I said, well, I have 16-millimeter prints. Well, he didn't even know what 16-millimeter print was <laughs> because in Hollywood, actors or producers or directors, they would have 35-millimeter screening rooms in their home, and they would bring in a projectionist from the union, and they'd have a party, and they'd run some recent film that they got or an old picture of theirs, but they didn't. he didn't know that there was small, thin film that you could run on a small machine. You could do it yourself. Sure. So he said to me, uh, well, how many of my films do you have? I said, that's a good question. Let me count them. I, this, that, this, that. I said, the Red River, Stagecoach, this one, that one. He said, how do you have all that? I don't have those prints. <laughs> Did he remember he was in all of them? Yeah, he did. No, he did. And he, I, I had 14 of them then. Mm -hmm. I almost have about 100 of them now. I'm still a big fan of John Wayne. And uh, so it was a very interesting, long interview with him. I got to meet him uh, almost a dozen times in different circumstances. And he got my magazine, and uh, I sent it to him. And he said, he saw me at a a premiere of a movie. Mm -hmm. I was waiting for him to come there. He's showing up, and he put his hand on I says, Hiya, kid. How you doing? And he says, I got your magazine. I like the article. It's really good. And I said, he said, Could you send me some more copies of the magazine? I said, Well, they come 50 bound from the printer. Mm -hmm. uh, I'll have my office send you a package 50. Would you really do it? Yeah, if I say I'll do it, I'll do it. <laughs> so he was very nice, and he he liked that. You do a that. good impression there. Well, I sat with him doing this article. Uh, let's see, from eight in the morning till uh, one in the afternoon. Mm -hmm. So, like we're sitting here like this. Sure. John Wayne, no act, no anything, just shooting the breeze about old '30s pictures, the things that I liked, and I would ask him about a specific picture. He couldn't believe I knew that. I said, well, you know, in that scene, they really were shooting live ammo. Mm -hmm. And then he goes out and rolls up his leg, and he says, look at that. He had a big scar on his knee. I, it was very nice to me. And uh, later on, I was thinking, I said, Gee, well, I don't know, ask him for a job. Would have loved <laughs> to have gone out to California and worked for John Wayne's company. But I'm not saying on the handout system, I would have helped him. First of all, I would have gotten prints for him, for his collection, for nothing, because I was good at doing that mm -hmm. from studios. He said, well, how did you get them? I said, well, for you, any company will give it to you. I said, just call them up and say, I'm your secretary, call. Mr. Wayne would like an old 16 millimeter print of this, that, or the other thing. So anyway, uh, it, it was one of the things I did uh, quite extensively, and I had a very good friend of mine, Joe Franklin, who had a television show in New York City. He was very well known. Mm -hmm. And he helped me. It was my first real contact into the entertainment industry. And he helped me with a lot of things. If I were doing a film or I wanted to do something or meet somebody or do something, he was always having me on his show and interviewing me for something or asking me to help him with something. And sure. he knew just about everybody in the industry. He was very popular. Sure. Well, 
I know that you're um, known for a lot of your horror comedies and the independent horrors that you produced and made. What was your first indie horror that you actually produced? Well, it's a funny thing how that happened. Mm -hmm. You know, these things don't get planned. In other words, if you went ahead and planned something and you say, I'd like to make horror pictures, I'd like to do this, that, or the other thing, mm -hmm. it doesn't happen like that. There's always a, a million impediments to your doing something. Uh, as I said, I was a big fan of photography, still photography and motion pictures, and I subscribed to a popular photography magazine, and there weren't that many magazines. There were a few that were at that time mm -hmm. out. And um, they had an article in there about City College in New York and the City College Film Institute. And it okay. seemed very interesting, a place you could go learn about making films, use equipment and meet people and all that kind of stuff. So I was a student in New York at Stuyvesant High School. I was what's known as a science student. Mm -hmm. <laughs> to get in there, you had to have top grades and you had to be a science student. And that's what the school was about. Well, that gave me an in because I was a step up from the average student at an average high school in the New York area. Mm -hmm. So I had hopes I could get accepted by City College because it was a free school if you got there where the other, at that time, film schools that taught motion pictures were on the West Coast, mainly UCLA and USC. And the ones that built up in New York came later. Mm -hmm. But it was too costly for my family to send me out to California. Uh, plus, I'd never been anywhere. I'd never gone anywhere. And I was very young because I had skipped two grades. So if you graduate in high school normally at the age of 18, I was 16, so I skipped two years. And I was 16, but I looked like I was 12. <laughs> I really did. I looked very young. And so couldn't get people to take me seriously. It was a hard thing to do. You know, if you, you look very immature, you've got to really work hard to get people to accept you. That's why I grew this originally. Well, there you go. <laughs> but, you know, it's better because when you get older, then you don't look so old. It, it just it works against you when you're young, but when you're older, it helps you. So I got accepted into the Film Institute. And uh, what was I doing at that time? Going to college, I was working. I worked all the way through college mm -hmm. at different jobs. I was a film editor. I was working in uh, being a projectionist. I was teaching audiovisual use in Hunter College. I had many different jobs I did, plus making my own little movies, mm -hmm. plus going to the Film Institute, plus whatever... I guess uh, it was just a lot of stuff going on, plus working for Jim Warren on the magazines. Yep. So the fact that I liked horror films, I picked that up from two areas. Number one, comic books. I was a big comic book fan, and comic books always had horror comics, monsters and horror. I picked it up in there. And then, in addition to that type of thing, I used to listen to radio programs when dramatic radio existed, before there was television. And most of the things that were on of the dramatic shows, if they weren't soap operas for women, they were something in the mystery or horror area. Mm -hmm. The Shadow, I Love a Mystery, all these different kind of weird things. So the weirder the better for me. I like sure. those weird things. And... Uh, so that background, plus working for Famous Monsters of Filmland magazine, pushed me into horror. And when I got to City College, I also was on the programming committee of running films. Well, there was a lot of interesting films we ran. After a while, we ran out of money. So what could I do? Borrow films from friends, take things from my own collection, run it for this screening uh, process we had, mm -hmm. and uh, a lot of them ended up being horror. So what happened? The school paper 
called me the horror man and came after me. Sherman is lowering the standards of City College and this, that, and the other thing. I'm being torn apart. Interesting. Then the head of the Film Institute, he was teaching a course, and in that you had to make a small film. Mm-hmm. Well, I wanted to make a film with a man by the name of Ray Lewis, who had been a composer. I met him through Joe Franklin in his office. He was old, very old, and he had written, It Ain't Gonna Rain No More, No More. It was a famous song. It goes way, way back. Mm -hmm. And I said, would he be in my film? Well, what's your film? I said, an old man, Broadway and 42nd Street, giving out money to people as they walk along. Nobody takes it. They think there's something fishy going on. He then takes his whole thing with the money, a little case with the money, dumps it in the garbage, disappears into the crowd. Later, people come over there, and they look, and it's real cash. And he's gone. They didn't know what it was. And then I was going to use his song on the track. It ain't going to rain no more. So we're waiting to get started on this silly thing. And uh, this man gets sick, goes into a hospital. I don't think he ever came out. Oh, jeez. And... The, the course is going by, the term is going by, and I've got nothing. Everybody else is working, and they're working, and they're working, and they're working. Whatever these silly films are that they were making, it took six months to make. Short little film. Sure. Uh, one guy was making a thing about a ballerina dancing in the new library. It was a big building had big, big stairway, a ballerina dancing while a sculptor was sculpting her. They were, everybody <laughs> there was arty. Very artistic. I was kind of low class, okay? <laughs> and all this was going on, this was going on. And so here am I with nothing. And the professor said to me, he said, you're going to fail. You're going to get an incomplete mark because you didn't complete the course. You've got to make this film. Mm -hmm. And then he made fun of me. He said, because you like all these old pictures, he called me a foof, F-O-O-F. I said, what's that? Friend of old films. And also called me the horror man, because I was tearing down the Film Institute's great artistic background, running all these horror pictures I ran mm -hmm. there. Today, horror pictures are run at all colleges all the time. It's a big deal. Of course. But anyway, that's what he did. So he said to me, why don't you make a film about a vampire who robs a blood bank? <laughs> That's what he said. Mm -hmm. Just like that. I said, well, I don't know if I want to do that or not. But he said, why don't you do that or do something? So I get an idea to do a film. And I write a little script. And I find a friend of mine who was pretty weird. He was weird. He was. He's gone now, <laughs> but he was weird. No names, please. No names. And I make a film in one day. Are you talking about quickie picture making? That's what goes with low budget movies because time is money. In one day, I shot this whole thing. Mm -hmm. These people are shooting for six months. I shot it in one day. <laughs> called The Weird Stranger. Mm -hmm. It's a weird guy in black, like the Phantom of the Opera and blah, blah, blah. And he's walking down the street. Anybody he passes, they're frightened. They run away. It's that kind of a thing. Sure. And then we see he's coming to a studio. It's casting a horror movie. And the guy in there says, I'm sorry, you're not the type. <laughs> and that was basically the idea of this thing. Well, it was a satire. It was fun. And uh, it was technologically way ahead of what the others were doing. They were doing things that were silent. Then they added what we'd call a needle drop take a symphonic record and just put that music on playing. Grand. I had a full synchronized score that matched the moods. I had um, uh, sound effects, and I had dubbed sound. And where'd I, you get all that from? Well, my own library of stuff okay. I had. Lip sync sound that we put in, dropped it in their mouths to dub later. Well, anyway, as much as he hated to do this, this professor had to give me an A. <laughs> and the thing that he hated most of all is the fact that I didn't put the city college seal on it. The school had a 
you know, it's kind of a gothic looking seal and sure. the College of the City of New York presents and all that sort of crap. Well, all these people were shooting this thing in the school, in the film institute, with the equipment of the school and blah, 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 blah. I was shooting this on location in my house, in my workplace, in my screening room and all my stuff with my camera, my equipment, my this, my that. Be damned if I'm going to put the City College logo on it. I'm just not doing it. So he hated that because I had my own logo. It began with a Samuel M. Sherman production zooming out. Oh, my God. It's like I went to this professor and stuck a knife in his heart. <laughs> but what could he do? It was the best film of that term. He had to give me an A. Sure. Now, time goes by. Forget this. Many years later, my sister, Ruth Sherman, was making, was making films. And she was taking courses at the Film Institute. And she invited me to come for screening of their terms work. And they were much better pictures than we made. They were full lip sync pictures, long running time, et cetera, et cetera, mm -hmm. et cetera. Now I'm sitting there, I'm just, I was interested in seeing what people were doing. And I uh, was sitting there, as they said, now we're going to run the single film that is our favorite film in the whole history of the Film Institute. I'm, what could that be? What could that be? And on the screen, comes the weird stranger. <laughs> My crazy horror satire film. And the people loved it. They just went crazy about it. Well, the answer was very simple. In the time since I made that film, the taste of people towards horror, satires of horror, all that sort of changed. Mm -hmm. So being ahead of the curve was very interesting there. It must have been a very proud moment for you to get that. Tattoo. No, no. The only thing it did for me was to lead me to find the negative in the vault and take it. <laughs> I said, that's what you, you really like it now? Good finding it later. I'll leave you one print. I just took the negative. Oh, boy. Walked right out with it. That's what I did. But anyway, so much for that. You got another question for me? Of course. So what do you think makes um, horror and horror comedy such a unique genre? What, why do you think people gravitate towards it? Well, it's because it's different. Everything in life today, or at any time, tends to be rather similar and rather mundane and very uninteresting. But when you get to horror, there you've got the undead coming back to life, whatever they are, or zombies going after human flesh. It's different. It's not what you encounter in your normal areas of of storytelling or whatever it is, but I shouldn't say normal areas. It's become the normal area. <laughs> but at the time, why were horror pictures successful way back when? Because not that many were made. And some would say, oh, that sounds weird. And they'd go to see that picture, whatever it was. And it would be the original uh, Phantom of the Opera, the original Dracula, the original Frankenstein. Mm -hmm. They were so offbeat and different People wanted to see something different that wasn't the same old thing. So it went through many phases. And uh, having been, I guess, just fell into this, a specialist in horror films, where did it lead me? I'm saying, where's this leading me? Well, mm -hmm. I'm working for Jim Warren, doing articles and interviews and things mm -hmm. like that. I made this short at City College. But it's not taking my career anywhere. Mm -hmm. We had the famous director, Otto Preminger, at our school. We had other celebrity people came there and lectured to us. And Otto Preminger was there on the stage, and he was talking about how wonderful this industry is, how great it is, and so on and so forth. I just felt that was such nonsense. So I raised my hand. I'm in the audience. Uh, Mr. Preminger, uh, you don't mind me saying it. You're talking about how great this industry is, but this is an industry where if you don't know anybody in it, you're not getting anywhere. It's all who you know, what you know. I just kind of attacked them. They said, uh, who are you? My name is Sam Sherman. I'm a student here at City College. Oh, what are you doing? I said, 
I make films. I want to make more films. I want to be in this. Come see me after the talk is over. So I go up to see him uh, in the front of the auditorium there. Mm -hmm. And he said to me, again, he asked me what I was doing, so on and so forth, gave me his card. And he said, I'll be making a picture in Europe uh, next summer. Maybe you'd like to come <laughs> along and work on that picture. So I thanked him. I took his card. Never called him. Really? Now, if it had been somebody that made horror pictures, I would have been on the next plane out. But I didn't care what he was doing. Really, it was not particularly interesting to me. And it took me years to find out what was the picture he was making at that time. What might have I done had, you know, the road not taken? Sure. What might have I done or might not have I done? And he was making a picture called Bonjour Tristesse with a girl by the name of Jean Seberg who had played Joan of Arc and St. Joan for him. And she was a pain in the neck. She was one of these druggies or whatever her problem was. She was always screwed up and maybe he was trying to have an affair with her. I don't know what it was. But I'm just thinking to myself, what would my job have been if I got to work for Otto Preminger? Very mm -hmm. simple. I would have been the Gene Seberg Wrangler. Uh, this would have been uh, sure. 7.38 in the morning. Sam, where's Jean? Mm -hmm. Well, uh, Mr. Preminger, she's in her room and she's not up and she's not... What do you mean she's not dressed? Why are you on this picture? Get in there. If you've got to put the clothes on her, see that you get her dressed and get her on. I want her on this set in 15 minutes. I'm saying, gee, that's a great introduction to this sure. industry. I'm glad I missed it. Work your way up, right? Yeah, I worked my way <laughs> down from there. So the point was I, I didn't go in that direction, but I ended up being friendly with Erwin Pizer and Kane Lynn, who owned a company called Hemisphere Pictures, and they were a company located in New York with offices in the Philippines, and their third partner was Eddie Romero, and they made horror pictures. Not yet. They made one. Mm -hmm. Made horror pictures eventually in the Philippines, and they were quite good. They made some good films over there. But at the time I met them, they were making war pictures. And I was saying, why are you doing that? They said, because there's a big demand for these overseas. So we make them there. What year, um, what year was that around? That was around 63. Okay. Make them here in the Philippines, sell them around the world. And uh, I said, well, how do you do here with these war pictures? They were lucky to get $35 a play date. Hmm. They were doing nothing. I had bought an old picture from Erwin Pizer based on Nathaniel Hawthorne's The Scarlet Letter. Yes. And I liked it. It was an old picture, but it was, you know, old but interesting. And I wanted to reissue that. Now, I got friendly with a man by the name of Denver Dixon in Los Angeles. And he was an old timer who had produced and distributed many films. came from Australia originally. His first film he made was a western in Australia in 1910. And he was around the business a long time. And I was out there looking for fame and fortune mm -hmm. in Hollywood. That was in 1962. Everything I was doing was going nowhere. Begged my parents to give me some money so I could go out there and find fame and fortune in Hollywood. Well, it's a funny thing. It happened. Thank you for joining us with this interview with Sam Sherman. We're going to continue the interview next week with a second part of this. And um, I hope you enjoyed. And don't forget to check us out at hecklercane.com.